All right, well, good morning to everyone, especially those who are going to be coming in late to see this video a little bit later. Um, so let's go ahead and get started here. I do want to start with just a few quick announcements and then some recap with some concepts. So Monday's lecture is now on YouTube, so hopefully you won't have any trouble watching it there. Um, office hours will be at the usual time, 11 a.m. after class today and then 4 p.m. in the afternoon. And the next homework assignment will be due on Friday. Uh, just a notice to those who are listening into this video, um, I know that I said before that we were going to have final presentations, but I think it makes sense at this point just to cancel the final presentations and we'll just worry about the 10 homework assignments. Um, so I'll try to say more about this on a Friday, but again, we're just going to cancel the final presentations we had originally scheduled. Okay, so let's start with a recap here. Let's denote three things. We'll let F be an algebraically closed field. R will be the polynomial ring over F in N variables, and S will be the polynomial ring over F in N plus one variables. So of course the difference here between R and S is that I wanna think of R as the variables X1 through Xn, and then I'll think of S as what happens when I join, let's say a last variable, which I'll call X0. So we talked about the concept of a projective variety, and simply put, this is a subset of projective in space, which is irreducible and Zariski closed, right? So what that means is really just two things. <clears throat> Number one, that we have this ideal I of X, which is just the set of polynomials that vanish on everything in X. So again, this will be our I of X. I'm assuming that this here is a prime ideal, and also I want this to be homogeneous. So one way to say that is that Ix here is this direct sum as I intersect over polynomials that are homogeneous. That's what I mean by this Se here. Another way to say it is that Ix is simply generated by homogeneous polynomials. So we'll see some examples of this a little bit later. So again, I want a prime ideal that's generated by homogeneous polynomials. And second, I want it to be closed, which means that X should equal to its Zariski closure. And remember, the Zariski closure just means it's the zero set for this prime ideal IX. So in this case, it's the set of points that vanish along everything in the prime ideal. Right, so projective variety just means that it has these two properties, irreducible and Zariski closed. Remember that once we have all of this, then we can quotient our polynomial ring by this prime ideal x, ix, and we call this here the homogeneous coordinate ring. So again, it just looks like the coordinate ring from before, so we're just modding up our prime ideal. This here is an integral domain, which is also a graded ring. Simply put, meaning that I can write sx as this direct sum here, where each of these, in terms of e, just looks here like this quotient. So homogeneous polynomials of degree E modulo those homogeneous polynomials in the prime ideal Ix. So again, the homogeneous coordinate ring will be an integral domain that is also a graded ring. Just remember that because we're working projectively, we want everything to correspond to homogeneous polynomials. It's kind of the philosophy here. And finally, we'll define the dimension of our variety as the cruel dimension of the homogeneous coordinate ring minus one. Right, so again, the dimension of our projective variety will just be the cruel dimension of the homogeneous coordinate ring S of X, and then we'll just subtract one from there. Okay. Next, we talked about the idea of being a quasi-projective variety. And this, simply put, is a subset U, which is Zariski open in some projective variety X. Right, so again, a quasi-projective variety just means it has to be Zariski open in a projective variety. And simply put, what this means is that if you take a look at the points in X that are not in U, then this here should be Zariski closed. Right, so again, the complement of U in X should be Zariski closed. 
And this set T, I want to have satisfy a few properties. First, it better contain this prime ideal I of X. That's just to make sure that Z of T is contained in X. Right, so again, I want to make sure that this prime ideal is contained in T. Second, I want T here to be a homogeneous set. So being a homogeneous set just means that it should be the direct sum of these intersections here. And the philosophy here is that T should be generated by homogeneous polynomials. So again, we'll try to play around with an example of this later. But my T here should be generated by homogeneous polynomials. And finally, I really want to make sure that on the level of homogeneous polynomials, that really this intersection here, the homogeneous polynomials of degree E and the prime ideal should be contained in the homogeneous polynomials of degree E and T. Right, again, this is just to make sure that all of the homogeneous polynomials match up in the way that they're supposed to. Okay, so once we write this definition of what does it mean to be a quasi-projective variety, then we'll just define the dimension of this quasi-projective variety as the dimension of the Zariski closure. So the Zariski closure will be a projective variety. We can then talk about its homogeneous coordinate ring. And once we do all that, then we can define the dimension. Right, so again, the dimension of a quasi-projective variety, it's just the dimension of its Zariski closure. And then the last thing that we discussed that I do want to discuss a bit more today is this idea of the irrelevant ideal. So remember that we say that we have a homogeneous ideal if our ideal can be generated by homogeneous polynomials. Right, so again, any ideal is said to be a homogeneous ideal if it can be generated by homogeneous polynomials. So an example of this is what we're calling the irrelevant ideal. One way to say this is, it's generated by all homogeneous polynomials that are non-constant. Another way to say this is, it's simply generated by the variables x1, x2, through xn, and x0. So it's just going to be this ideal that's generated by these variables. So this here is a maximal ideal in our polynomial ring S. The reason I'm introducing the irrelevant ideal is that it satisfies the following property. This S plus is never contained in the prime ideal IU whenever U is a quasi-projective variety. So we'll come back and we'll talk about this more later. But again, the main thing here to emphasize is that this irrelevant ideal is never contained in this prime ideal IU. All right, so any questions on any of the reviews so far? All right, okay, let's keep going here. So the last thing we introduced last time was the idea of a projective curve. So remember that we had different examples and really we spent some time discussing what are some of these examples that we can play around with. So if we have here projective in space, this is a projective variety, S is its homogeneous coordinate ring, and its dimension is N. So again, P, N of F here, our projective in space is an example of a projective variety. So we saw many more examples. We can say that a projective curve is a projective variety that has dimension one. Right, so again, a projective curve is just a projective variety that has dimension one. But remember that towards the beginning of the course, we naively define a projective curve in the following way. We said that it should just be generated by one polynomial sitting inside of P2. Right, that was our naive definition. It turns out it's not a correct definition, but it still was our naive definition. To make it correct, we have to verify that our ideal, Ix, is a prime ideal. So again, we can define a projective curve more generally as a projective variety of dimension one. And naively, we define a projective curve in this way here as cut out by one polynomial equation sitting inside of P2, but that's really not correct unless our ideal is a prime ideal. That's equivalent to saying that this F here has to be an irreducible polynomial. So this F does not factor. 
So we found several examples of this. When E equals one, this here is a projective line. Right, so again, it's just gonna be this polynomial here where this F is homogeneous of degree one. Next, we said that a conic section was a curve where E is equal to two, but we have to check that it's non-singular. Remember that we said that non-singular actually allowed us to conclude that our IX was a prime ideal. Right, so we define a conic section as a projective curve where this F here is homogeneous of degree two, but we want it to be non-singular. And next, we define an elliptic curve as a projective curve with E is equal to three, which is also non-singular. So remember that here we did quite a lot of work. If you start with the projective curve of degree dimension of homogeneous of degree three, if it's non-singular, then you can do a lot of crazy tricks to write everything in short Weierstrass form. And once you know that it's in short Weierstrass form, then you have a nice numerical criteria to make sure that it is non-singular. So we really did a lot of work here in this third statement to get this here to work. Okay, so these are three examples we wrote down. And the last one we wrote down was kind of this long, complicated example. This was the idea of a quadric intersection. So let's say that we have a curve now sitting inside of P3. But in this case, it'll be defined by these two homogeneous quadratic polynomials. All right, so again, it's sitting inside of P3, defined by two homogeneous quadratic polynomials. And I'm not gonna go through all of the nasty formulas, but there's a way that we could associate a capital A and a capital B. And we know that when this discriminant here in terms of capital A, capital B is non-zero, then this Y here is an elliptic curve. And then we actually have a map that allows us to take points on X and then write down here points on Y, right? And the map is gonna be defined rather explicitly in this way. So again, if we assume that the discriminant is non-zero, then we have these nice curves that are non-singular. And actually, it takes a little bit of work, but you can prove that in this case, the homogeneous coordinate rings are the same. So I have my variety here, X. I have my other variety here, Y. And really, they have to be the same variety. That's kind of what the substitution here at the bottom says. So this example here was supposed to emphasize that you might want to work inside of P2 as we did with the elliptic curves, but our naive definition is a little bit too restrictive. Sometimes we'll wanna work inside of P3, right? And this was the idea of being a projective curve that is really sitting inside of Pn. You just have to make sure that the dimension is one. Okay. All right, so any questions on the recap here? Okay. All right, now, up to this point, we really have talked about a couple of different ways in which we can view some of these varieties, affine varieties and quasi-affine varieties, that we said that we can look at this idea of spec and write down an affine variety, a spec of some ring. So let me remind you how that goes. If we have an affine variety X, then remember that we have the following map. It will take a point on X, and then it'll write down this point here, this maximal ideal in spec of the coordinate ring. Now, this is a bijection because we're assuming F is algebraically closed. Right? Remember, everything that we do today, F is algebraically closed. So we know that if we have a point here, we can write down a maximal ideal over here in spec of the coordinate ring. And conversely, every maximal ideal over here in spec of the coordinate ring comes from a point P over here. If F were not algebraically closed, this is not true, but we are assuming that it's algebraically closed, so it is true. In fact, in general, if you give me an integral domain O, then we'll just simply define spec of O as an affine variety. All right, so yes, we do know that we really want M spec, but we're going to kind of abuse notation, so to say, and we'll just define spec of O as our affine variety. Right, so given any integral domain, we can do this here. Well, what I'd like to do today is discuss 
how do we do the same construction but for projective varieties? And so this is going to get into what a lot of books call the proj construction. Right? It's going to be naturally a generalization of this from affine varieties, but moving over to projective varieties. Okay, so here's how this goes. Well, let's back up for a second. And let's think. So remember that a, an ideal I is homogeneous if it can be generated by homogeneous polynomials. Right? That was our definition of a homogeneous ideal, an ideal that can be generated by homogeneous polynomials. Well, let's try to think of an example here. Um, fix a point P now sitting inside of N plus one affine space, and let's throw away the origin. Right, so pick a point, affine N plus one space, and throw away the origin. Then we have a maximal ideal of S, but notice that this is not a homogeneous ideal because in general, these here are not homogeneous polynomials, right? Homogeneous would actually mean that I would have here x1, x2, all the way through xn and x0, but I wouldn't have any a sub k over here. But because I do have at least one a sub k, and that's what I mean by staying away from the origin, that these here are not all going to be homogeneous polynomials. So we have an ideal, but it is not a homogeneous ideal. So I want to be a little bit careful. I actually, I do want to construct a homogeneous ideal. So let, let me look at the following trick. Pick xj minus aj, pick xi minus ai. So these here will both be polynomials in this maximal ideal. Now, let me look at the following difference. Here I'll take AI times XJ minus AJ minus AJ times XI minus AI. So again, I'm gonna take the difference of these two, some kind of linear combination. This is still in the maximal ideal. Right, because the maximal ideal, again, just looks like all polynomial combinations of these types of polynomials. But I've done a little trick here so that what's left actually is homogeneous of degree one. So that's what it means to be an S1. So again, I took the generators of the maximal ideal MP and I did a little trick here to write a homogeneous polynomial of degree one. So these here are actually sitting in this intersection. They're both in the maximal ideal and homogeneous polynomial of degree one. So if I do that, let's take a look at the ideal generated by these. Right, so again, I just want the ideal generated by these, which I can also write in this way here. And I see that this actually is a homogeneous ideal. So remember, homogeneous means generated by homogeneous polynomials. So we started with the maximal ideal, really a prime ideal that is not homogeneous. And we did a little trick here to write down an ideal which is homogeneous. This here, of course, is sitting inside of this MP. This, this is an ideal that's contained in MP. Now, I'm claiming here that it's a prime ideal. So let me try to give you a quick sketch of why it's prime. Well, let's take a look at this quotient. S modulo this ideal. I claim that it's a polynomial ring and exactly one variable. Well, here's the reason why. Stare at these equations. Right, so AI XJ minus AJ XI equals zero. Well, remember that not all of the a sub k's are zero. So if I stare at this equation here, then I can basically solve for my variables. And what I realized is that if I solve for them, 
I can actually write everything in terms of just one variable. If you wanted to, you could think of this as in linear algebra, what we're saying here is that here I have a system of equations and unknowns, and that here I know that my solution space is one dimensional. So it has to be generated by one variable t. Right, that's another way to say it. But again, all that I'm saying here is now try to solve all of these equations. Once you do that, then you realize that each variable has to look like a linear combination, sorry, scalar, times exactly one variable. So this exactly one variable that generates all solutions here and it has to look like this. All right, so each xk is ak times t, where t is the same variable for all of those. So this actually does tell me that s mod this ideal is this polynomial ring in one variable, but this here is an integral domain. And because it's an integral domain, then this proj mp has to be a prime ideal. So again, what we've done here is that we've started with the maximal ideal MP. It is not homogeneous. So we constructed a subset, proj MP, contained in MP that is homogeneous. MP was maximal, but now proj MP is prime. Right. It cannot be maximal because if it was maximal, then it would have to look like this here, right? AK, XK minus AK for some AKs. But I'll come back and I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. Okay, any questions on how we constructed this prime ideal here, proj MP? Right. Okay, and actually I actually realized that this here is a typo. This should be E strictly greater than zero. It shouldn't be equal to. Okay, so let's keep going here. So what's happening here with this irrelevant ideal? So remember that the irrelevant ideal was that ideal generated by these monomials, x1, x2, dot, 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 xn, x0. Well, I claim that this S plus is not contained in this prime ideal. Right, so here's the reason why. First of all, let's ask, what do we know about the zero set of this ideal? Remember that the philosophy is that the zero set should correspond to this point P, right? That's kind of the idea. But because we're working projectively, we've set up everything just in the right way. So we actually have this here, right? So now the zero set of proj MP is exactly one projective point. Right? That's just the way we kind of set up all of our argument here. So this proj MP, the zero set, now forms a projective variety right, because it's one point, so that's an example of a projective variety. But if S plus is contained in proj MP, then the zero set of proj MP must be contained inside of the zero set of S plus. Remember that when we're dealing with disease here, how containment gets reversed, right? So again, if Z plus is contained in proj MP, then the zero set of proj MP better be contained in the zero set of S plus. But now, again, you just kind of run through the different definitions, and what you find is that this intersection here has to correspond to the set of points where these equations have to simultaneously vanish. The reason being, remember that these here correspond to these variables here, x1, x2, dot, 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 xn, x0. But now ask yourself, what are the set of all projective points where all of their coordinates are zero? So this would mean something like that the x1 coordinate of p is zero, the xn coordinate zero, the x0 coordinate zero, but the only projective point where that works is all of the coordinates are zero, which means it's the origin. But we know from the way we set up projective space, the origin is not there. So there are no projective points where these are simultaneously zero. That's why the zero set here has to be the empty set. But now you'll see this is the problem. I can't have a set that contains one point to be contained in the empty set. So this is a contradiction. So again, the irrelevant ideal is not contained in this ideal here. 
But remember, this is what I mentioned at the very start of class today. This is also what we discussed last time. The irrelevant ideal is never contained in the ideal of a quasi-projective right. So this just gives another proof of exactly that statement. We did the same proof on Monday. So in this way, we now have the following. If you give me a projective point, then I can write down this prime ideal that does not contain the irrelevant ideal. Right, so this is exactly what we just got finished working out. If you give me a projective point, I can write down a prime ideal that does not contain the irrelevant ideal. Now, I'll just point this out just in passing since we're not really going to use this. Um, remember that before we were really talking about this idea of maximal ideals. Remember that we said that for an affine variety, if you give me a point, I can write down a maximal ideal. So why is it that we went from maximal ideals to now we're just looking at prime ideals? So here's kind of one way in which you can help yourself ratify that. This prime ideal, Proj MP, is actually maximal among all homogeneous ideals I satisfying this. So we can't have I to equal MP, because as I just mentioned, MP is never a homogeneous ideal. But instead, if you look over all homogeneous ideals, I, that are contained in MP, and then ask what's the maximal amongst that, that's really what proj MP is. So this is where the maximal part comes in. You just have to be a little bit careful because, again, the MP here is not a homogeneous ideal, but I really only want homogeneous ideals. So I just picked the maximum one, one amongst those. Okay. So now we're able just to put everything together. Say that X is a projective right. Then we're inspired by the following map that will take a projective point and write down this prime ideal. All right, so this is gonna be kind of our inspiration. So using this map here that goes from this prime, sorry, this point to this prime ideal, again, it's not maximal. So now this map is not the same as with the affine varieties. This is a very different map here because I have to look at the homogeneous polynomials. So then we'll abuse notation, we'll just say this. When I write proj, I really mean the set of ideals that are prime, but I want them to be homogeneous, and I want to make sure that they do not contain the irrelevant ideal. Right. And if you want to know by irrelevant ideal, I mean exactly this here. So this is the irrelevant ideal sitting inside of the homogeneous coordinate ring. So again, the philosophy here is, I don't just want to pick maximal ideals, because that, that's not really right. I don't even really want prime ideals. That's not right. I want homogeneous prime ideals that don't contain the irrelevant ideal. Now, if you wanted to know intuitively, why are we doing all of this? So what, like, what's really the philosophy here? Well, the I, remember that I want this to be a homogeneous ideal because I'm dealing with projective points. Right, I can only look at these points up to scalar multiple. So because I'm dealing with equivalence classes here, I have to work with homogeneous polynomials. So the homogeneous polynomials are just the natural aspect dealing with projective space. On the other hand, you may wonder what's so interesting here about saying that it does not contain the irrelevant ideal. Well, it comes back to what I said up here at the very top. The philosophy of the irrelevant ideal is that that corresponds to the fact that for a projective point, I cannot have the origin. That's all it comes down to. I'm just not allowed to say my a1, a2, dot, 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 a n, a0 is equal to zero. I have to stay away from the origin. So this condition here, the irrelevant ideal is not contained in I. That just simply means that when I'm dealing with projective points, I have to stay away from the origin. Right, that's all that that means. It's really nothing deeper than that. 
So now we're actually not going to really use this for the remainder of the course, but I just most, mainly wanted to introduce this to say that if you really wanted to know how do you think of projective varieties in terms of spec of things, this is the way to do it. So you really will want to have spec of an integral domain where you have homogeneous ideals that do not contain this irrelevant ideal. But that's, that's the philosophy here. Okay, any questions on how we did our project construction? All right. Um, is it easy to see that the project of M sub P is maximal among homogeneous ideals I with this property? Um, I suppose it depends on what, what you mean by easy. But probably one way to say this is, um, you would first have to say that you really want, what's what I'm trying to say? You would really want homogeneous ideals. And probably the next thing is you would have to look at these polynomials here. So I think the philosophy is that you would kind of go back, let me just go back a few slides. You would go back to this identity. And I think you probably would have to ask the question, I will admit, I haven't really thought about this, how you would prove this, but I think that it comes down to this question of, are these elements here inside of your ideal? But really, to be a little bit more careful here, I'm not necessarily saying that this is the maximal amongst all ideals, just that this is a maximal one. So here you would just have to kind of ask the question, do I have another ideal line between I and MP? And I think that comes down to kind of looking at these polynomials here and then asking, well, what do you know? What's contained in what? Right. But, but I will admit, I haven't really thought very closely about um, how do you prove that this here is maximal amongst these ideals. I guess I'm wondering whether you can say something like, oh, because after you apply Z, um, you have, you're like one point away from the empty set. Mm -hmm. There can't be any I between, but I'm not sure if that's a property that we can use. Right. Um, yeah, see, it, it, it is a little bit tricky because the problem is this MP here is not homogeneous. So, I mean, like writing this Z of MP in projector space doesn't make any sense. You can really only do Z of something C of I of I here is a homogeneous ideal. So um, yeah, I could maybe think about it a little bit more and then try to come up with the sketch for, for later. But, um, but yeah, I, I will admit, I haven't really thought very carefully about how this will work out here. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. All right, so I wanna move on here for the last eight minutes or so. And I wanna go over this concept of hyperplanes and affine varieties. So let me set things up by doing the following. Now remember, very start of the course, we talked about how the affine plane is related to the projective plane. And the way that we did this was we said that we can always embed the affine plane into the projective plane by taking here an affine point and then sending that to the following projective plane. All right, so this was a trick that we used over and over and over again. So in fact, we can go a little bit further and we can actually take a look at the image of this embedding. So the image, of course, is just gonna be the set of points that look like they come from some affine point. But because the last coordinate here is one, I can write this as the set of projective points where the last coordinate is non-zero, which really means it's just the set of projective points where I stay away from the set of points where this here is equal to zero. All right, so again, I'm just gonna identify the image of this embedding as the set of projective points where I stay away from those where the last coordinate is zero. So this means that the image here is a non-empty Zariski subset, which actually means it's a quasi-projective variety. So this is actually what's really weird. This whole thing that we've been doing over and over again, this A2 going into P2, actually what we've been doing is we've really been saying A2 is a quasi-projective variety. 
right? That's actually the way that we've been setting this up the whole time, but we never really set it this way. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write down a theorem that says that we can always do this with any affine n space. So the theorem goes as follows. Pick a linear polynomial, so a homogeneous polynomial of degree one, and let's consider the following set. So H is the set of points where this here is equal to zero. So I claim two things. Number one, H is a projective variety. And number two, the complement is a quasi-projective variety, which actually is an affine variety. So now here's an example of something that's both a quasi-projective variety and an affine variety. So it's the two together. So this here, actually is a generalization of what we just wrote down. So first let me call this H a hyperplane. When N is equal to two, remember that we just simply call this a line or a projective line. And what this proposition says is that I can think of A N as a quasi-projective variety. Right, so we're gonna go over the proof of this over the next few minutes, but this is just saying that affine in space is a quasi-projective variety. Right, so this is the generalization of exactly this trick of this embedding that we've been doing over and over again throughout the whole course. Okay, so here's how the proof goes. It's actually not, not bad at all. So let's show the first statement. Why is it that H is a projective variety? Well, the ideal corresponding to it is a prime ideal, right? Because this F here, it's irreducible. I mean, I can't factor a linear polynomial. F is a homogeneous polynomial. So H, IH has to be a homogeneous prime ideal. Right, remember that in order to show that H is a projective variety, we have to do two things. We have to know that it's irreducible and it's a risky close. Showing that IH is a homogeneous prime ideal is equivalent to showing that it's irreducible. So that's the first half. For the second half, well, H is the zero set of this polynomial F. So it is Zariski closed. Right? So that's all you have to do to show that something is a projective variety. Show that it's Zariski closed and that it's irreducible, i.e., that this ideal IH is a homogeneous prime ideal. So first half, the proposition is easy, not, not hard at all. So let's try to do the second half. Why is it that that complement is both quasi-projective and affine? Well, H is a risky close, so the complement, by definition, is quasi-projective. Right, that's just the definition, it's just the complement of a Zariski closed set. So what I have to show now is that X is actually an affine variety. That's really the hard part here. Well, with the loss, without loss of generality, let's say that this coefficient C0 does not equal to zero. I mean, I have these N plus one coefficients, so let's just pick one. And now let me look at the following map. So here I'll take a projective point and let me write down the following affine point. Right, so again, it's the map here that takes a projective point and writes down an affine point. So I need to show that this is a well-defined bijection. It's both injective and surjective. Well, first, to show injectivity, let's say maybe two points map to the same. All right, so P and Q here are projective, but let's just say that they map to the same. Well, if I stare at the coordinates, so I stare at this coordinate here, stare at this coordinate here, then notice that here this involves the A1, this involves AN, so then what I see now is that the A's have to be equal to each other up to scalar multiple for some lambda, I mean, just set this here equal to like C0, B1 over so on and so forth. 
set this last one here equal to C0 BN over so on and so forth. You just kind of stare at it, move things around, you just find this here. But this is for, sorry, this should be for K equals one, two through N. Right, that's just because here I'm dealing with these N coordinates. But now let me use the fact that we have this here. So here's how I'm defining lambda. Because again, I'm looking here at the denominators. So now if I just subtract, here's f of p, here's f of q. Sorry, that should be a c sub k, but here's f of q. So everything subtracts off except for the last one. Right, so everything here gets canceled because of this first one. So I'm just left here with the last one. So now I find this. But now, because I have these two, then I see here that the projected points have to be the same. All right, so this is just kind of a silly argument. It's just a matter of looking at some algebra and you get things to work. So again, if phi of p equals phi of q, then p equals q, projected. The other direction is easy. For surge activity, if you give me a point in a n, it has to come from the following projective point in x. You just write it down. So this here is a projective point sitting in X. Okay. Okay, so this actually does show that if you take projective space, right, so like this here, you take away a hyperplane, then it actually is this affine in space. Right, that's really what we've shown. So actually we do get back affine in space. So what I want to do next time is I want to completely generalize this even more. And we're going to prove a big theorem that says that, notice that this X here is a quasi projective variety. And I can think of this now as an affine variety. I'm actually going to prove in general, if you give me any affine variety, not just AN, but any affine variety, then it is a quasi projective variety. Right, so that, that'll be our big theorem to finally say then, all of these definitions now all kind of make sense. So the most general type of variety that you'll ever write down in algebraic geometry will be a quasi-projective variety. And that, that's what I want to end up proving next time. Okay, any questions on what we've done today, what we have so far? I have a question about this map or in general maps between varieties. Mm -hmm. Like besides showing that it's a bijection of sets, are there any additional properties that you like want to verify? So I, I never really said this, but there is this idea of amorphism between two varieties. Amorphism really means a couple of things. So one is that it needs to be polynomials. So like here, I do have a ratio of polynomials of degree one. So that, that was one of the first things, that these are actually rational maps. The second thing is that they need to be defined on Zariski open subsets. So I didn't actually say it, but these are actually defined on all of that, right? So here, I don't have to worry about the denominator vanishing. Um, and it's, it's a subtle reason why, but I really don't have to worry about the denominator here vanishing. So the whole point here is that um, these are maps that are defined, there are ratios of polynomials, and they are defined on a Zariski open subset of X. But in this case, the map is defined on all of X. So, so that's really what we mean by a morphism in the sense of a map between the varieties. It needs to be rational and it needs to be um, defined everywhere. Well, defined at least up to, to risky open. Um, th the other thing is that I didn't quite say this, but this is technically a bimorphism because it is a bijective map. So it's both injective and surjective. There, there's kind of the subtlety in algebraic geometry of a bimorphism that is not a bi that is not a bijective map, but it's kind of a weird thing. So you have to kind of figure out what do you mean by a bimorphism. The simple point is that usually it's defined on a Zariski open, but it may not be, be defined everywhere. So in this case, it is defined everywhere, which is why everything works out very nicely. But there is a more general concept of maps between varieties that says that you only care that they're defined up to some Zariski open subset. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. Okay. Any other questions then?
Okay, all right, then on Friday, we'll finish all of this up by talking a bit more about how quasi-affine varieties are related to quasi-projective varieties. All right, so see you on Friday then. All right, thanks, Professor. See you on Friday. See you. All right, thanks.